this is a good group. We have a good blend of people who are on the creative side up at the top. We have some good, some writer directors today. We also have some people who are on the business side, the finance side of the business, a few investors, former or current uh, studio executives. That's a, that's a great blend. It's a fairly good reflection of the Slated community as a whole. And it's also a good mix for the focus of our conversation today. So let's go ahead and jump into that conversation. Give you just a moment to load our first slide. Okay. Slide one. Okay, excellent. So because all of you who are joining today are Slated members, you know that Slated is a marketplace for independent films, but it's worth taking a moment to define what that actually means. So a good marketplace is one in which um, there are efficiencies and sort of conveniences that are created that exist outside the real world market. And a good marketplace should use signals to illuminate for its participants where the sweet spots are and where certain risk lies. On Slated, of course, we know that that means filmmakers can list their projects, those projects get scored, and then those scores are used for targeted matching to all of the various components that those filmmakers need to move their projects forward. And again, ideally, an online marketplace is one that is more efficient and more convenient than markets in the real world, but they should reflect real world market dynamics. So how are we doing at that? Uh, so far, 1100, over 1100 slated listed movies have been released. Over 200 of those have been released theatrically. And those films have grossed over $500 million in worldwide box office. We get around 2,000 new films listed on the platform every single year. And of all the films listed on the platform so far to date, between the platform introductions and the executive producer service team, we've introduced about $2.8 billion in capital to those films. Um, for the executive producer service team, that tabulates to around one offer a week. And that stood true even during last year, during 2020, when there was a pandemic and, um, and production stopped. So a big part of my job on the executive producer service team and a big part of the executive producer service team's job as a whole is really offering managed to support, support to those interactions, facilitating those introductions and mediating the differences in perception between all the various parties on the EP service team, namely we are mediating that conversation between filmmakers and investors. You can see that circle in the middle represents ideally that common ground where we're finding between all the parties. And I would say that one of the, the most common issues that we come across is filmmakers who for one reason or another fail to understand things from the investor's point of view. Now, if you are a young filmmaker that could simply be due to a lack of experience. Um, and if you are an experienced producer, maybe that's because you're used to working within a studio system. But what's important to understand is that in independent film, ultimately the independent investor or the financier expects you to, to perform all of those functions in that right gray column before that film becomes investable to them. So again, you know, if you're, in, if you're a newer filmmaker, maybe you're just not experienced with sales, or maybe you haven't put together a package yet, or maybe you're not, you know, you have a great script, but you haven't done uh, financing, structured financing before. Uh, if you are an experienced producer who's work, we're used to working in the studio system, that studio system is its own sort of ecosystem that orbits around the studios as buyers. And the studios really decide all those things in the right column, right? They figure out what package is necessary to greenlight the film, at what budget that uh, film can be greenlit. They figure out what the releasing schedule, the releasing pattern is going to be like, how much should be spent on PNA, so on and so forth. But in the independent world, investors really expect you to do all that work for them. Remember, this is independent film. So this is your idea. This is your passion that you're bringing them. You can't expect the independent investor to do all the work and also write the check. And, you know, as we often say on the film finance team, the easiest thing for an independent film investor to do, if your film isn't ready for a check, is to just not invest, is just to wait. Because there are thousands of other films out there that are gonna have all of their ducks in a row. So how can we then sort of bring this information to 
um, those filmmakers that need to get their films to become investable and, and ready for a check. I think the first step is seeing things from the investor's point of view and what does that actually mean? Well, this is the total global theatrical and home entertainment market of the last several years. It may look like a little bit of a blast from the past. It is 2019, but 2019 is really the last full year in which we had a fully functioning theatrical market. It's also a really good indicator for how the theatrical market in particular is going to continue performing in the second half of 2021 and beyond. For anybody who says that you know theatrical is dead, they need only to look at last month's results in China where during one Lunar New Year weekend, two films broke $600 million in box office after they reopened theaters. But that's an anecdotal example. If you zoom out, zoom out the global uh, market macro trends suggest the same thing. So this screenshot is from the MPA theme report, which they publish every year. The next one's coming out in a matter of days. And it shows, if you look at that, uh, if you look at the pale purple sections of the, of the columns, it indicates that theatrical around the world really grows by a couple percentage points every single year, pretty reliably. And it's done so for decades. That home entertainment chunk, that dark purple is also growing, but it's not cannibalizing theatrical. It's growing on top of it. And if you look at the difference between 2018 and 2019, there was a 14% increase in home entertainment and yet global box office still increased. But there is a problem with the theatrical market in particular for independent films. And that's that in the United States and Canada and in our sort of domestic territory, these 10 studios or these 10 um, financiers are really soaking up nearly 94% of all the available dollars, which in, in this year, 2019, was around $11.3 billion in domestic box office. Again, the studios are taking home nearly all of that, and they're doing it with just 124 films. So they're doing it with fewer films than, than they've ever made before. You can see that trend on that fourth from the bottom line, that green box in the middle, 124 films. That, those 124 films are pitted up against 711 independent films. So those 700 plus films every year are left to fight to the death over that remaining 6% of the domestic box office. That's not a pretty picture for independent film investors, but it, but it actually gets a little bit worse. It gets a little riskier because the last two slides that we, well, we looked at are assuming a film gets a release at all. And we know that many films don't. This study that was done in 2019 uh, that looked at all of the films produced in 2017. So they gave the films a couple of years to find their sort of audience, to find their release if they were going to, found that over 40% of independent films never see a release at all of any kind. That means they never get introduced to an audience. There is never an opportunity for an audience to pay money to see them. That in this study represents around 350 films, but we know that that number is fairly conservative because that same year, Sundance got over 4,000 feature films submitted to them from around the world. So it's very likely that thousands of films are getting made every year that never ever get a chance to make their money back. Uh, that's no good for independent film investors in that chunk. Remember, investors lose all of their money. So they've written a check for a quarter million dollars. All of that's totally gone. Now, if you look at that bottom left quadrant of the pie chart, no box office. These are films that have zero dollars in box office. That's another 35% of movies. Um, because they have release dates, we can reasonably infer that they were likely streaming titles. Um, but of course, we know that on streaming, uh, you know, unless you have a big theatrical release to peg it off of or somebody spending a lot of marketing dollars for you, you're, it's very, very difficult to break a million dollars there too. And in that top left quadrant, that leaves 25% of all films produced uh, that represents those 700 movies that do some box office. Of those 700 movies that do do some box office, how many would you guess break a million dollars in US box office? I'll give a couple seconds to let those wheels turn. The answer is fewer than 16% of all those movies make more than a million dollars. So that is one of the reasons why, you know, as we're having conversations with independent filmmakers who tell us that they want to make a movie for 2 million 
or 5 million. That's great, but it does really put pressure on the filmmaker to build a package that is going to beat out 84% of all independent films that year. And if you can't put that package together, that's fine, but it does put, as our head of film finance, Jay Burnley says, downward pressure on the budget for you to make your film at a price that actually gives investors a chance to make their money back. So, you know, again, th this, is, this is a problem for investors, obviously, if they're losing all their money, if the film never gets released, but it's a problem for you too, filmmakers, because if your movie comes out, does it, if I say it doesn't come out, it never finds a release or it comes out and it makes zero dollars or it's ripped apart by the critics, it's going to become that much more impossible for you to make your next movie. And you know already how impossible it is to make just one. A recent study that we did that looked at the careers of 10,000 film directors found that for the vast majority of first time directors, those that never get a major release, the, the vast majority of them will never make a second movie. So we really are not just in planning for our next film, we're not just planning for that film, but we're also hoping to establish a good relationship with investors for whom we make money and set up a career. So how then can we be in that top 16% and beyond of movies that break a million dollars? The answer, as you may have guessed, is analytics. Let me start with the definition for what predictive analytics mean in the film industry. So predictive analytics really are calculations that demonstrate the creative and, and financial potential of your film. And they change as your film changes, as your script changes and your budget changes and your package changes, so do the analytics reflecting those potential values. Uh, now, it, the first thing to know about analytics, aside from the definition, is that if, if you aren't using them as a filmmaker, you really are in the minority. And that may sound like an inflammatory statement, but it true it really is the truth. Uh, obviously, we've all read dozens of articles, or at least seen dozens of articles about how Netflix and Amazon are crushing it with their use of viewer analytics. And they're using viewer analytics not just to mitigate risk, but they're using it really to evolve their business model. They're using it to program their slates. They're even using it to determine what departments they set up, set up within those companies, when they should pursue theatrical, et cetera. So obviously they're pivotal to these major new entrants in the marketplace, but traditional studios too have been using analytics for decades. And for those um, former or current studio executives that are on the call today, you can attest to the fact that there are whole departments within studios whose job really is to run the numbers. And they do that in the form of analytics departments, strategic releasing departments, marketing departments obviously are very numbers focused. So are sales departments. So it's not an accident that studios are beating the pants off of 700 independent films. They're running the numbers. They know what's most optimal for each, every single one of those films. And they're ensuring that those films aren't greenlit or released until they have the best chance based on all available data to, to do fairly uh, well. And we also know, of course, it's slated where we service over 2,300 investor companies, including many hundreds of institutional investors, that there are large financiers out there, well, uh, out there as well that co-finance alongside the studios. And they're using our predictive analytics on top of the studio provided due diligence to determine which films are really going to be the best bets. So if you are an independent filmmaker, and this all sounds very overwhelming, you're not a studio and you've never used analytics, that's, that's okay. Don't feel bad about it because the truth is that it's never really been available to you until now. Slated is really the first company to offer studio grade, cutting edge, creative and financial analytics to the entire filmmaker community at large and to do it in the context of a marketplace that allows you access to things you need to make your analytics stronger. So let's talk about what those predictive analytics actually look like, what they are for Slated and how they look when applied to specific films. So these questions should look familiar. They are the three questions that regardless of whether or not you're inside the studio system or operating outside of it, you need to know in order to evaluate your involvement in a film. Who's in it and who's making it? How good is the script? And can it possibly make money? And the best way to think about, well, I should say first, 
Our answers to those questions come in the form of the team score, the script score, and the financial score. I'm going to define exactly what that what those are and how they work in a moment. But the way to think about metrics in the context of a film marketplace is really to use the analog of real estate. Um, that's an industry in which marketplaces are a little more mature and they've sort of achieved a large level of adoption. So if you think about going on Redfin or Trulia or Zillow, whichever is the platform of your choice as a renter or a buyer, you're gonna be presented with thousands of tiles of properties that look fine. Not every single one of them is your next home simply because it has two beds and a bath and you're looking for two beds and a bath, right? As a buyer or a renter, you're really looking for that sweet deal. You're looking for that sweet spot where the aesthetics of the property line up with you and the numbers make sense and the property safe and doesn't require a lot of work. That is very similar to what our metrics on Slated um, illuminate for its participants as well. The, the team score sort of gives you an indication of, you know, I guess the, the comparable example would be like aesthetics. What are the photos? How, what's the value of it? How does it strike you? How does the package of that property strike you? The script score is really the structural stability of the thing. You know, if we, if we move in, will it fall apart? You know, in terms of the script, does it make sense? Is it telling a story that answers all of its questions? Is it a well-told story? Uh, what's the potential there? It's sort of like a blueprint for your film. Uh, the financial score is obviously the, the financial potential of the film, but it's, it's also, you know, if you think about it in terms of real estate, it's the comps, right? In, on Redfin, it's so critical to look at what the comps are in that neighborhood and what Redfin estimates that film could potentially sell for. In fact, you don't want to offer a lot more no matter, you know, than what Redfin is estimating that property is worth. So, you know, in real estate, you would never knock on somebody's door and ask the homeowner, hey, uh, what, what comps do you suggest uh, for your home? What, what would you suggest? And they say, well, uh, there's this huge mansion in Beverly Hills that sold for 14.2 million. And then there's this um, six story craftsman in South Pasadena that sold for two. You would, never, you would never allow the homeowner to pick their own comps for their property because obviously they're gonna choose comps that benefit them. So why then an independent film, are we still looking at decks that have filmmaker selected comps that suggest their film will perform somewhere in between Get Out and A Quiet Place. It might perform somewhere in between Get Out and A Quiet Place, but the data shows that there are hundreds of other movies like your movie that don't quite do as well. Maybe your movie's more similar to them. That's why we have financial analysis for films. And this is a perfect time for me to point out that when we calculate the script score, we're doing that with, with man and woman power, right? We're doing that with human power, uh, we're having people on our development staff take off the cover page or we remove it for them and they read the script. That It's as simple as that. They are uh, getting the script with no cover page. They don't know who submitted it. They don't know if it's packaged. They're just responding to the story on the screenplay. We do that simultaneously three times. Those people sort of express their experiences of reading the script in those numbers that you see there, they will score every single category. They will write a paragraph supporting the score for that category. And all of those numbers sort of bubble up to a hundred point score uh, between one and a hundred. The same is true for team score and financial score. They're all between one and a hundred. For the financial score though, getting back to that comps, um, that comps parallel, it's algorithmically driven, right? So whereas we like human beings responding to the creative of the project, we actually, it's, it's very helpful for us to rely on machine learning and analytics to run the numbers and say, of the 10,000 movies that have been released in theaters, what are the films that are most similar to yours based on your genre and your themes and your package strength and who your director is and your script score and pull closest the ones that are not only more similar, but are released more recently. Um, the only one I haven't touched on is that first one, the team score, I'm going sort of out of order here, but the team score, again, a score between one and a hundred is basically the collective experience of the people making the movie. So Emily Blunt is going to have a different actor score than she does a producer score, for instance. And as you assemble that package on Slated, that team score is going to represent to potential investors and collaborators, what is the relative experience level of that team in the roles in which they've been hired. So I think I've done a, a decent, if somewhat scattered job of giving you top line definitions for the team score, the script score, and the financial score. 
Let's take a look at how they apply, how these analytics apply to films that you know. And then I'm going to take a beat to dive into the script score in more detail because uh, that's where we often get the most questions. Water break for me. Feel free to take a sip yourselves. They're like, I didn't need a sip. Why am I waiting? Okay, here are three examples of films you may know. We know that Trial of Chicago 7 and Sound of Metal it, are shortlisted for the Oscars this year. Now, in the case of Trial of the Chicago 7, this is not a, officially a slated listed project. This is one that we ran analysis on confidentially. But for Sound of Metal and Palmer, they are both slated listed projects, not just listed, but they've been unslated for, they were unslated for a number of years. Our executive producer service team helped out on those pro projects when they were brought to us by different production companies for over a year. And what that means is that if you are a slated investor and these projects we know were uh, visible to um, slated investors, we have very granular visibility settings so they could decide who they wanted to be able to see them and, and who and that they could be hidden from everybody else. If you were a slated investor, you would have seen Palmer and Sound of the Metal on the platform while you were browsing and you would have seen them with these scores indicating their outsized potential over the past couple of years before they were made. Um, this is an excellent screenshot. There's a lot to digest here. Um, obviously, you have your package scores, um, but what's, oh, and I, I have a typo, I haven't updated there, but the, the project score for Palmer is 72. Um, and what there's a couple things that are interesting to point out here. What do I want to point out? There's so much. So the, first of all, the financial scores for all of them are strong. So we know that due to a pandemic, these weren't released in theaters, but they, they're all above a 60, which is where the financial score sort of indicates break even for its investors, 78, 77, and 82. Another thing that's interesting there is you'll see Sound of Metal is actually the highest here. So it's not that Sound of Metal necessarily is, would have done the most box office, although we love it here at Slated and think it might have. It's, it's, it's the profitability relative to its cost. It's an indie film that was packaged really well, that had a tight budget, that delivered a lot of value and obviously a great script. Speaking of which, look at the script scores here. All of them are strong scripts, but we have a really good, obviously the Sorkin script scored exceedingly well. And I'll, I, I hasten to point out that again, these are blind reads. So although our team in reading that script may have said, hey, this is somewhat Sorkin-esque dialogue, um, or maybe through inner circles, they were aware of the project. They didn't know for sure that this was Sorkin's Trial of Chicago 7, and yet they gave an 85, which means that script really rocked. The Palmer script score, 277, really great read. Comparing it to the Sound of Metal script score, that script was also awesome, but when you, but perhaps wasn't the same sort of, um, you know, uh, fireworks show on the page that um, Trial of the Chicago 7 was. And yet, look at the likelihood certified fresh. It is a 69% for Sound of Metal for that little indie with its package. That's really high. We're going to talk a little bit more about what are the reasons that that is a 69%. 69% likelihood certified fresh doesn't mean that's going to be the Rotten Tomato score. It means that's the likelihood, more than two in three chance, that that film, if made, would be certified fresh 75% or higher on Rotten Tomatoes. I know I'm getting into the weeds a little bit, but that number has a lot to do with not just how great the script reads, but all of the potential that our three development staff members wrote about in their comments, as well as the package that was brought to the film. I think I've done a, a thorough job of going over these three examples. Let's take a minute to dive into the script score a little more and talk about what its implications are for writers and investors. So if you're a filmmaker, this I found to be very a very consequential um, study that we did. Of the first 1,326 projects that were, that were submitted to us, and they were submitted from everywhere, from agencies, from um, independent filmmakers, from people we didn't know, uh, we looked at them to see what number of them had been made a couple years later. And if you scored below a 70 script score, you had a 6% chance of getting your project produced. If you scored above a 70, you had a 16% chance of getting your project produced. So that is, if you are a filmmaker, particularly if you are a writer, it's very much in your best interest to get that script score as high as you possibly can because it has a direct impact on not just whether it gets made, but all those steps in between, how people respond to it 
when they send, when you send them the script. We know from our experience on the executive producer service team that the difference between sending out a 68 script in many cases, and there are outliers, there are 68 scripts that are really exceptional, but the difference between sending out most 68s and most 76s, for instance, um, is the difference between an investor or a producer not really ever responding or really thanking you for sending them that material and making it a point to tell you how great a read it was, whether or not they choose to invest. So you can triple your odds of getting your film made by getting your script score up. We've seen script scores increase by 10, even 15 points. Sometimes I think in one or two examples, we've seen a 20 point increase in script score from one draft to the next. So it's consequential for you as a filmmaker. For investors, it's even more consequential. The study that we did, which looked at 400 script scores, which we ran on films before they were produced, found that there's a massive difference between 75 plus script scores and below 70 script scores and below 75 script scores in this draft um, in terms of what that film's chances are of being certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes and getting nominations um, for and wins for awards. So if, you know, again, if you're an investor, you know this, if you're a filmmaker, put yourselves in the investor's shoes, they're getting sent stuff all the time, right? They can choose, if, they're, if they have a choice to prioritize scripts that are going to be an 80 and above or 75 and above and know that those will be great reads and know that, that on so doing, they're gonna double or triple their odds of being certified fresh films, critically well-received films, then those are the scripts they're gonna focus on and they're gonna say, you know what? 70s are great, 68s are great, but for now I'm taking my weekend reads to read the stuff that's 75 or higher since I have an experience of liking those scripts more. Okay, great. So uh, I think this is a perfect time for me to dive into the platform and do a little bit of a live demo. We'll run some financial analysis. Um, we'll look at some specific examples. Let's start by going a little deeper into the example of Sound of Metal and take a look at that film page. Wow, it worked. Okay, cool. So this is the Sound of Metal uh, film page on Slate. You can see that it's marked as released. We have time locked all of these scores here on the right. So all of these scores reflect the value of this package that was put together prior to that project's uh, production and release. And I want to look at the script analysis example for this film. Let's open up the details here. Now, as I was saying, the script score is 74, which means on its face, it's a solid script. But the signals within the analysis itself are really illuminating. Here we have tone is a four. So that's really meaningful. That means that the genre effectiveness of this film, the atmosphere was really above average. These scores are out of five, but fives are very rare. So for, for three, all three people who read to agree that this is excellent, this is far above average, that's really meaningful. Um, dialogue two is also pretty high. 3.7 is really high for indie films, but originality, 4.0, premise, 4.0, right? So those are those are really high individual scores. The likelihood certified fresh calculator knows that. It knows that these sort of co correlate with a certain type of film. In addition to knowing, by the way, let's pop back up to that, certified fresh of 69. It also knows who the team is making it and what their track records are critically. So it knows, for instance, that Darius Martyr had directed a feature film before, it was a documentary, and that that was a fresh feature film. Even though it was quite some time ago, this guy had the potential as a director to bring this one in. And of course, we know it took this film many, many years to get made. And this whole team worked really, really hard to make the optimal version of this project. So before we move on from Sound of Metal, I want to go down to the tone section in particular. Remember I said this is a section that indicates genre effectiveness, um, theme to some extent. And let's read what the readers had to say. You can see all these comments Right? Ultimately, you get over 10 pages plus of comments from your three readers. So if you don't score a 70 as a filmmaker or as an investor, they're going to, to walk you through what were the sticking points for them, what bumped for them, how could it be fixed, what really worked for them. And you're getting every single time you're getting three different takes from people who often have different taste, which is a big part of being predictable uh, creatively. So let's see tone. I'll just read through a few snippets. So it strikes an appropriate and effective tone for the genre. It's uncommonly moving. Okay, that sounds pretty good. 
The next reader said, it's a thoughtful internal drama that successfully portrays the harrowing experience of losing one's hearing. That sounds amazing. Uh, from the opening scenes, the protagonist POV is favored. So there's a lot of really sort of artistic um, slant that's being given to this film. They picked up on it and they telegraphed that in the script analysis, which tabulated up to its certified fresh likelihood. Let's look at the last reader's tone section. This narrative strength is its ability to portray a highly sensory world, as well as the frustration, heartbreak, and victories experienced within it while remaining subtle. Okay, so if I read that tone section, I'm losing my mind because of how elevated that project seems. And, and who is this genius development staff member that wrote that? This is a sneak preview of a new feature <laughs> that I'm shoehorning into my presentation, but I'm really excited about it. You can see that this reader, it's not a mistake that they were able to pick up on that potential despite not having access to the lookbook, not knowing how Darius was gonna shoot it, not knowing how the sign design, there was a lot planned for the film that we knew about on the EP service team that was not uh, discernible from the script. And yet this person picked up on it. Well, it's probably because this person has read over a thousand scripts at Slated alone, and this is their track record. Every single member of our team on the development staff has an incredible track record of picking great films. They gave recommends to Arrival and Bad Moms before those films were made, considers to Chirac and American Honey before those films were made, and they've passed on Neon, De Neon Demon and All I See Is You, all of which was at the script stage. You can go through your Rito bios, and this is almost too, uh, too new a feature to announce, but I'm hoping by the time people see this, um, that it will be live and bugless on the platform. Uh, on another 1184 scripts here um, for reader number two and 630 scripts. Now, you're not gonna get readers who are all that experienced on all of your um, analysis. We're constantly adding new geniuses to the team. So you may have a couple of fresher perspectives and somebody who's a little more veteran and, and that balance is actually necessary for creating as accurate a picture of uh, a predictor of how your film will perform as well. So in conclusion on the script analysis side of things, you should really look at this as a pre-pre-screening of your movie. This gives you a sense of how audiences First, your first, your producer and investor audience, but then your ultimate audience is going to respond to the film creatively. I think that's a good demo for uh, the script analysis. Let's go ahead and dive into financials and we'll run some live simulations here. If I can get this page up, boom. Okay, cool. So we're coming into the last section of our conversation today. This is a fake a uh, project that I've invented, Key to the World, sound interesting. Um, I've put together what I think is a fairly impressive poster here. And I'd like to make the movie for $2 million starring me. Um, that is, is, you may be laughing, but it's, it's not an uncommon um, scenario that we see for indie films when they're just starting out, right? Someone's really excited about their script. In this case, they had a 72. They know that indie films are commonly made for around $2 million and they'd like to star in it, but maybe they haven't put anyone else uh, on the package yet. So we can see that financial analysis based on that package is making a number of assumptions and then it's running projections to indicate the performance there. Um, so the estimated team score here is a 4.2. That's based on my experience as an actor. So the model is saying, uh, you have never done this before. And I'm, I, we have no choice but to guess that you're gonna find other people who've never done this before based on what we know now. They are taking into account the 72 script score, the $2 million budget that I don't have any tax credits. And the model is guessing a nine screen release. Now it's important to note that our financial model has to assume a release of some kind in order to run theatrical numbers. So uh, in the future, we're gonna have a likelihood of theatrical versus streaming release indicator, which I'm sure we'll demo at some point in a webinar like this one. But for now we're saying, okay, if this gets a theatrical release, it will be a tiny theatrical release. It will be nine screens because it stars no one made by nobody. And if you're lucky, you're gonna make $119,000 at the US box office. But even if you do that, investors lose all their money. Look, of two financial score. So let me run through a couple other scenarios here to show you the ways that financial analysis can change when we change our budget and our package. Let's do this. So let's add an incredible director. Oops, as director. 
FanPave. I'm going to click verify later there. And that indicates that I'm running this in a, in a simulation. And then, mm, you know what, let's just stop there. So let's say I somehow convince Taika Waititi to board the project as a director, everything else remains the same. And let's go ahead and run those projections. So what it's doing right now is looking at 10,000 plus comps, all theatrically released. And it's pulling closest those ones that are most similar in terms of genre, budget, and package. Let's see what the assumptions are. Okay, so right now, nothing's changed. Why is that? Because right now, this is still a verified only snapshot of my projection. So this is what, if I made my film page visible, what investors would see. Investors um, and other collaborators can only see projections based on what your actual package is. But if I click this button up here, estimate score if all verified, that takes me into simulation mode. So I can see what the impact of Taika Waititi would be on this particular film. You can see the most notable thing is that the team score, estimated team score jumps up to a 45. So the model is saying, okay, Greg doesn't, he still thinks he's starring in this movie, but he knows Taika Waititi. Uh, so I'm guessing that based on Taika's experience as a filmmaker, we're going to have some experience on the team in terms of producers and the other roles to get this done. But that's still not a great um, team score because it's sort of taking the average between my experience acting and Taika's experience directing. What changes did it make now that it's assuming we're going to have a decently experienced team on board? So one thing right away, the release pattern goes up to 53 screens. That seems pretty realistic, right? We're not yet assuming that this is an incredible movie. If you were an investor looking at this, not everything would line up. But if it were to get made and get released, a smaller but slightly larger release pattern makes sense. On those 56 screens, it's doing about $1.6 million um, domestically, but the financial score is a little more than break even. So if, if me and Taika team up for a supernatural drama with a 72 script score, and we do it for $2 million, our investors could make uh, their money back, but they're not gonna make anything more on top of that. So let's get a little more realistic. Um, Taika doesn't really make movies for $2 million anymore. Let's say he wants five. One more zero here. And let's just run that with the higher cost. Now we are um, in um, scenario three, we're gonna do about six or so of them. Boom, okay, cool. So interesting. So nothing has changed about the package, 45 estimated team score, production budget has gone up. What happened? The financial score dropped to a 17. So now our investors are losing nearly all of their money. Why? <laughs> so first of all, we're getting a bigger release. Two, can you see this? This is why I should have chat on. 204 screens is the release pattern for this $5 million movie. Why? Well, the model's looking at the comps. It's looking at the data and saying $5 million movies probably have higher production value. They're probably more the sort of candidate for a wider release. So although this isn't a wide release by any stretch of the imagination, it may be a platform or maybe we put it out on 200 screens and see how it does. On those 200 screens, those being that, that being sort of the widest release that this is assuming, it makes $2.1 million. So it's out on more screens, it's making more, but it's not making so much more to justify getting that additional you know, uh, increase in budget given the package has remained the same. So let's make another change and build up the package a little bit. I doubt that it's, it's sad to admit this on a webinar, you guys, but I doubt that Taika wants me to star in his next film. So let me add a real actress. And this is somebody who obviously is super famous off an incredible streaming um, show right now, but she also uh, has some box office from The Witch. Again, I'm clicking verify later. Verify now would send a message either to them if they're a slated member or to their reps. We don't wanna do that, they'll be They'll be very confused to get that from me this morning. Um, so I've clicked verify later, and now I can run that simulation based on her attachment in this movie. I'm still in the movie, all right? Don't 
get too excited. I'm still in it, but she is now the lead character. And maybe I'll have, maybe I've been downgraded to sort of a speaking role, um, which I feel I can do uh, under this, you know, give me a few takes. I need a few takes. Okay, so now we're running financial analysis based on that new package. This is, I love, so I'm actually, I didn't say this, but we're on a test environment right now. So this is the version of financial analysis that's going to be released very, very shortly to the, to the live platform. And I love it. This team score has gone up to an 80, right? So it's now it's looking at this. It's basically bumped me out of the way in the, act, in the acting calculation. And it's looking at this now as a supernatural drama with a decent script directed by Taika Waititi and starring um, Anya Taylor-Joy. Um, my certified fresh likelihood also went up a little bit, not a lot, but the financial score now at $5 million is 91. Now we got a face on the poster. Our release pattern is wide. It's 1,645 screens. So it's saying if we put this package together, it's qualified for more of a wide release. It's not a Marvel Avengers sort of release. It's not 3,000 screens or anything, but it's it's a, it could do well on a thousand plus screens. If it is released and it is decent, it's gonna make around $25 million at the US box office. This is what the data says for packages like these at budgets like these. And keep in mind, again, this is a probability driven set of projections. So you can see you know, that 30 million worldwide box office is really the highest probability in the middle, but to the side, we have 2% likelihood of much more, a 2% likelihood of much less. And this is sort of how to think about the financial projections. Now, I've run through all these fantasy simulations. If you're an independent filmmaker, you're certainly thinking to yourself, way to go, Greg. You've, you've managed to show how Simulator says that Taika Waititi can make a bunch of money. Tell me something I didn't know. And how does that actually help me? So, I, uh, so let's do that. So let's kick off all of these fantastical attachments and figure out if I wanted to make a version of the movie that's within my immediate reach, what that would look like. I'm gonna run a couple different versions and try to find the version that, that the data says makes the most sense. So I've said, okay, look, I'm not, I'm, not giving up, uh, I'm not giving up my lead role, but I'm going to make it for less. Let's try $500,000. I'm told that that's a decent amount uh, to make an independent film for. So running the numbers, it's looking at all of the um, other movies out there that are sub million dollars and star precisely nobody. And the financial score dropped back down to a two. My release is back down to nine screens. And now I'm making $90,000 at the box office. That's actually, that's worse in terms of gross revenue than the $2 million version made. And, and we know that that makes sense. So, okay, I get it. I'm not worth $500,000. Can we try $50,000? Um, it may sound absurd to some of you participants on the call today, but this is actually a you know somewhat painfully familiar scenario that we see with a lot of independent films who do their raise through friends and family. They get something in the neighborhood of 50 or $100,000 and they make a movie with their friends. And that's, you know, that's fairly common. How does it look financially? Well, those of you who have done this, and I've been party to it myself, know that uh, the financial score is not looking great. You can make some money. You get a release on uh, platforms, on streaming, uh, but it amounts basically to $63,000 of the U.S. box office. That's based on seven screens, so a lower release now because the budget is even lower. And that's a 40, 41 financial score. Our investors are not breaking even. And for everyone who has done this experiment, it's a worthwhile experiment. It's a good learning experience but it's not a formula for making um, your investors a lot of money. And it's not really a formula unless you're a stunning um, auteur writer director for demonstrating your ability to, to make a profit and, and make your next film. So as the last scenario, I'm going to put together something that um, our analytics would guide you towards that certainly could uh, make sense for this film. Let me kick myself off as an actor. Uh, because after two and a half years of trying to get this film made, I get the message loud and clear. Add myself in a role that is a little more appropriate. I'm going to click verify now because I'm me. So I don't have to worry about bothering anybody. It automatically verifies me because it knows I'm me. And let's say that I convince um, a, a friend of mine to produce the film. 
So I'm going to add a friend of Slate. It's a much more talented and experienced producer than I am. And I'm going to beg him to come aboard the project. He reads the script. He's like, okay, all right. I see. I see. It's a 72. There's some strong stuff in here. I think with the director pass, it could be a little better. I'll take this ride with you. I say, thank God. Now I'm on my way. And because he is such a connected producer and he's made several movies before, let's say he brings on a fantastic indie director. This is uh, one of my new favorite directors produced a film, directed a film rather called The Guilty um, that came out a couple years ago and I believe is getting a remake. And so you can see now, look, this is not a fantasy scenario. These are real talented, working, independent filmmakers. We have a 45 score and a 49 score. So we're not Jennifer Lawrence level, but these are experienced people. They're offsetting the risk of my relative inexperience. And let's say we get together, we have a few meetings and we realize that we need to make this for a price, but uh, it needs to be realistic for us to get, it, to, to get it done and actually deliver some production value. So I'm moving this to that sort of SAG ultra low budget threshold, uh, a million 50,000. And let's run this scenario. Again, this is the kind of package, even though it may sound like a miracle to even get this far, this is the kind of package that you need to sort of land in to be among that top 16% of independent films where it makes sense. The value of the film makes sense for the amount that you're spending. And this again is, is, is very realistic. So for this film, we're breaking even. We're doing it on 80 screens. Um, and that film is making $1.3 million at the domestic of box office with an estimated 52 team score. So again, not, not an A-list package um, necessarily, but for an indie film, it is an excellent, excellent, excellent package with highly experienced, talented, and successful people who have really knocked it out of the park with million dollar films and in that level uh, before. And we're doing so, you know, we're, again, we're landing at a 63. So the last thing I'll do on this page before we start to wrap up here is let you know about how you can get to a package like that using the tools available on Slated, even if you aren't fortunate enough to be friends with Fernando, okay? I'm going to add, say you wanna to get to a Fernando level producer. Let me add a role and say that I'm looking for a producer for my project. I'm gonna say, we, I need help because this is a pre-package scenario. I need help. I know that I can't start with a zero producer, right? Because that's that's too close to home. Let me scale up to 20 is actually a pretty good. 20 is actually pretty good. 20, okay? And that right now there are 68 producers on the platform who are willing to be approached by a 72 script score of my caliber. I'm gonna click save. And you're gonna see right here that here's my opportunity. I haven't switched it on yet, but because I haven't even made my film visible, but if I were to make it visible, I would have 62 matches. And if I were to make it visible and click through, you would see who those people are and you would be able to message them. It doesn't mean that they instantly love your project, but it means they're willing to take a look at that submission. You could do the same thing with financing. I'll take one minute to do that. Let's say I'm only interested in equity, but uh, no, I'll do that. I'm interested in both. Uh, but I really don't want to mess with anything that's less than 10,000 bucks. And I don't care about an investor score. They can be a first time investor as long as they're savvy. Automatically, there's 300 plus matches of people who would consider a query from me. And they can ignore the query altogether um, if they want. That's perfectly okay. Or they can welcome me to submit the project. So in this way, right, you know, we have filmmakers from all walks. And not all of them have that network already built in. Not all of them come from the studio system, but this matchmaking system has really proven to be sort of a decentralized virtual studio for all of you independent filmmakers who know that you need a producer that's more experienced than you, who know that you need to start thinking about sales, but maybe don't have those connections yet. Well, if you're a writer director and you've done your job, you have a great, say you have a great proof of concept and you have an incredible script, 
those analytics are going to allow you to match with the people to start those conversations and build up that package. If you want to see more analysis, we have a samples page that I'm going to zoom into now. It has hundreds of projects with script scores and financial scores that you can check out. Um, almost all of them were run before those films were released. So you can see what we predicted versus the reality. And in, you know, in conclusion here, as I, as I wrap up, I want, to, I want to end on a positive note and say that you know, we talked about that $11.4 billion in US box office. And, and we were talking about the fact that studios are soaking up 94% of that. And that can sound sort of dismal. But the remaining 6% is actually over $700 million for indie films, uh, for indie films to fight over. So if you are an independent filmmaker, it really is incumbent upon you to figure out what the potential of your film is and put it in a direction to perform in that top 100 um, or so independent films that break a million dollars and potentially take home some of that 700 uh, plus million. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of success to be had um, financially and creatively if we can optimize our projects as much as possible. And at the very least, do the due diligence and know what the potential is going into the project, be able to share that with our investors and get all the ducks in a row so that they can be in a position to consider coming on board with you. I think that wraps everything up. So um, thank you so much for joining me. Now, the one thing I forgot to say at the beginning is that this webinar is being live cast to YouTube right now. Um, so it will be available there after we, uh, after we wrap up today. If you missed anything today, if you came in late, you can go back there to check it out. Um, you can also refer a friend, please do that. Please, while you're on the YouTube page, subscribe to it, subscribe to our Facebook page and subscribe to our Medium channels. These are things people normally say at the beginning of a webinar, but please do all of that um, because we will be publishing new research, et cetera. Um, okay, I think now that all that's uh, wrapped up, let's go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Uh, and let's see if I can find it. Oh my gosh, we have some great questions here. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So, where are we at? We're at 11? Oh boy. Okay, we did wait a few minutes. Okay, so let me, I'll, I'll answer a few of these questions, maybe about five questions and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So Bob, hi Bob, says, as a writer, when we get an email suggestion given, suggesting a given, let's say financier, does he or she get that same email recommending us? Uh, that is such a good question. I kind of touched on it in the conversation, but it's something that, that we are, are actually adding clarity and context around those matches on the platform as we speak. It's a very commonly asked question. The answer is when you're matched on Slated, it means that you meet the specifications of that person or company um, saying that they're willing to basically accept a message from you. So on Slated, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a network, but you, you can't simply just go message, you know, Steven Spielberg if he's a member or Olivia Wilde if she's a member. Um, you have to sort of meet certain qualifications. So Olivia Wilde has to say, I'm willing to consider script scores above a 75 and uh, of a certain package or with an attachment that's of my level, which is sort of the default settings for someone of her level. And if she does that, then she's accepting basically queries from you. So if you get a bunch of matches and someone really cool is on there, send them a message. We have some best practices for what to say in that message in our help section on Slated. So you can see what are the different formats for queries that I can use that um, you know, are respectful of that person's time that make clear to them all the things they need to know in order to consider accepting the submission from me. And like in the real world, not everyone, not every query is going to go answered. Not everyone's going to say, yes, send the script over. But I will say uh, it's pretty good, man. I, of all, when I look at the script scores that are above 70, they're querying people. They're really getting some very high level introductions. In some cases, even on EP service projects, those introductions, that platform matching is, is, is doing an incredible job to build value and make those films investable so that we can take them to a, a broader group of investors. In some cases, those films have been entirely packaged up with those match matches. I wouldn't have believed it, but it's true. So check out your matches for those opportunities, write respectful queries and see who's willing to take a look. Jared, off topic, is the Filmonomics podcast ever coming back? Um, I think this is it. Uh, we're, no, we're not going to do probably, we're not going to do a podcast again, but we'll, we will be delivering you content like this at some 
irregular interval <laughs> intervals. I can't say how much right now. This is really the first of, 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 of a webinar like this that we're doing, but we do we do want to get back into a cadence of communicating with our filmmakers as much as possible and bring all this as much of the, the value of the platform to you as possible. Um, Tom asks, how can we determine what an actor scores before we lock him into a project? That's a good question. And uh, I think you saw it a little bit in that simulation, right? So you can add somebody and you can run a simulation and see what their value is. Mine's something less than $50,000, but you can kind of get a sense of if you put certain people in lead roles, what that film will be worth. You can also click to that person's profile page and that profile page, if they're a slated member, will have a breakdown of how their role is tabulated based on all their past experience. So you can say, is somebody more valuable as a producer or an actor, for instance. Looking through a few more questions here. Uh, these are some questions that were asked, I think, before I got to them. Some, but somebody asks, are the analytics subjective or are there algorithms behind them? And of course, we know script score is, is subjective, but it's, it's based on three pro level people reading your script who have read thousands of scripts before and predicted huge winners. The financial analysis is algorithmically driven. It looks at the data. It does not allow us or the filmmakers to, to hand select comps that are less like how that film could perform. Anonymous attendee asks, if we purchase analytics and it's determined that it won't make its money back, then do we ditch the project? Um, no, no, I don't think so. I, look, I think there are some projects that certainly are going to be uphill battles. And certainly after you've tried and tried and tried, you realize, hmm, this concept hasn't aged so well, or this thing needs to sit on the back burner for a little bit and needs to rest. And maybe I need to come back to it with fresh eyes in a little bit. Some films make themselves known to be, you know, impossible to get made or not worth your effort, of course. But I will say in the, the you know, in the vast majority of cases, the analytics just show us where the threats for that to that film are and it allows us opportunities to address those problems. It's like life, right? We can hide under a rock, we can be scared of all the terrible things that happen, or we can say, what are the things that are worrying us and how can we attack those things? The same way with film, we wanna be successful. So we need to know if, if three people are reading that script and it's not coming across super well, if everybody has a problem with the same thing, let's fix that thing. Let's find a way to convey that thing in a way that serves our vision. Same with the budget. If we are just thinking about this fundamentally wrong, maybe it's a $20 million movie. Maybe that's what serves this concept then it's good to know that now before you've exposed the project to all potential investors. So I think I answered that question. Um, how does Slated choose to be involved with projects? I think is, is the question, it's a good question. So we wanna help um, every high scoring project on the platform as much as we possibly can. That's just, that's a fact. So if you score 70 or above on your script, you are going to get a message from either me and or our EP service coordinator. They're gonna ask a few questions, figure out where you're at, and they're gonna help get you to the right place or at least point you in the right direction. That support is free. Um, so if you get a script score and it's 70 plus, we'll help you. If you get a script score and it's below 70, we'll still answer your questions about the analysis and help point you in the right direction. But anything over 70, we're going to be asking who's directing, who's producing, what are your plans for cast, what's the deal? And we're going to try to point you in the right direction. If you get above 70 and you have great answers to those questions, then you're getting on a phone call with our whole executive producer service team our head of film finance, myself, our director of development, our EP service coordinator are gonna chat with you about what the plan is and how we could perhaps be helpful in doing some personal outreach on behalf of the film as well. And as you all probably know, there's a deal for if the platform gets your film made, um, which you agree to upon listing your film and making it invisible to investors. There's also a deal for if, if our team joins as executive producers, all deals apply only in success. So if the Slated platform doesn't directly help you get your film made or package your film up or finance your film, um, then it's not you know, credited or feed in any way. Same with the executive producer service team. So we have a very much an eat what you kill model and we are excited to help any project that scores above a 70. Somebody asks, I have a 73 script score, but my team score is gonna be low. Will this kill our financial score? 
I think I ran through a pretty um, thorough scenario there so you can get a sense of um, what, uh, what your options are, but you can run simulations and try to hit the package you need so that your financial score will be at least solid. Have I been out of frame the whole time? I don't know. Okay, and then um, somebody asks, very good questions, uh, the qualifications of the readers. So you shortly, soon, by the time you're watching this on YouTube, most likely, you will be able to see our reader bios, at least creatively see what they've read, what they've passed on, uh, what they've recommended in the past. Everybody on our team is truly exceptional. They are a point of pride um, for, for me and for this company. They are all sensitive people. They care about your project. They really truly care about giving you advice that make, makes you happy and that is valuable to your process. And they're honest. They don't, they don't pull any punches, but they know how to give constructive criticism. Um, before they even join the team, they're people that I've ensured, uh, you know, have predictive, um, have a predictive track record of having excellent taste and giving great notes to projects. So, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but truly <laughs> like these are the best readers in the business. In some cases, they're, uh, you know, you, you won't see this in every bio. We share that information selectively, but in some cases they're, they're working writer directors. They're, you know, we have one reader who is, uh, you know, attached to three different studio movies right now as a director. That person is still taking time to give feedback to our process because they love working with us so much and they love giving notes. Believe it or not, this person loves giving notes to filmmakers, even though they're getting paid to do rewrites for studios and they have films scheduled. We have another person who's written every episode of the first season of, uh, of a major streaming show, still reading for us. Um, we have another person who has pitched, sold, produced, written multiple digital shows for a major network. So um, th this, you know, and we have people who, um, who aren't in the business that way, but who are re have really good taste and are really uh, have an incredible track record at giving great notes. So could not be a stronger team. And uh, I'm always happy to answer questions on your particular film about, you know, who read and what something means if it's not clear. We're at 1110, I, I don't know, maybe I'll get a high sign from above that I need to stop early, but if not, I'll answer a couple more questions. I would like to see what a low budget film, 250,000 with unknown talent looks like. Awesome, okay, so I think we ran through that. Couple more and then we're done. So somebody asks, what happens if I don't purchase analysis? Um, so what, what happens if I don't purchase analysis? So that's a good question and Slated is a free platform. So if you don't purchase analysis, then, um, then that's okay. You're not obligated to. You can still list your film. You can still see who you're going to get matched with, but, I, but we cannot protect you from the harsh realities of this business, which is that the people who are valuable, their time is really valuable and they don't look at stuff that isn't vetted. So if you don't have a script score and you don't know anybody and you don't have a high score yourself, you can match with other people like you but you really have to do something to send a signal to the market to let people above you know, hey, I'm batting at your level, I'm worth your time. I've developed this script, it's really good. Or um, I'm an incredible writer, or I have experience in my respective role. So again, you know, the most viable participants in the marketplace are looking for those signals to determine what they should get involved with. Because, you know, and I say this all the time, um, it, it, when I'm when I, when I'm training new members of our development staff, when I'm talking to students, 99% um, of this business is passing. 99% of this business is passing. Why? Because even Netflix cannot make all of the movies that it's submitted every year. You know that Netflix has billions of dollars. It's still passing on 99% of the stuff that's sent to it. Every entity is just one entity. So how do we, the, for those of us who are working professionals in this business, we need to prioritize our time by taking a look at stuff that is vetted by trusted sources. And the script score is one of the, the strongest signals that you can send to filmmakers and say, who are a little bit ahead of you in their careers and say, look, I've done my part. I've developed an incredible project. And again, we see that when you have a 75 plus script score, if you get to that point you're, and you message the people who are matching with on Slated, you're gonna, you're gonna get a few positive replies. You're gonna get people talking to you who you would not have been able to access 
otherwise, and they'll be open, you know, they'll be open. Then it's really up to you to demonstrate that you're professional, that you know what you're doing, that you're open-minded and so on and so forth. So no, you don't have to get scored. You can just be a member on the site. You can message other members with your relative experience. You can even list a project, but I will be honest, you know, unlike other platforms that are, will take your money for hosting with the promise that maybe one of their thousands of members stumbles upon it, um, you, you, will, you, you, you will have opportunities for promotion, but I don't see a serious investor getting involved with a project that, that hasn't been vetted in, in some way. That's really how you send a signal to them that, that you're ready for them. Um, so I do recommend a script score. It's, you know, it's 395 bucks on the platform to just get your basic script score. It's a lot, but it's 18 hours of our development staff's time to read that script and give you 10 plus pages of notes. We don't mess around with this sort of one-off read. Somebody writes a paragraph business. Every project that comes in, we have three decision makers read at the same time, and we let you know exactly where you stand. So, you know, if you are serious about moving this project forward, it's, it is, $400, very, very, very well spent. And a lot of writers that I know who are, you know, aspiring, but also professional level writers use it to make sure that their script is coming across well before they send in the next draft to so forth, so on and so forth. Um, last question. And I think I answered it. How can you determine whether a film breaks even from the financial score? 60 is break even on the financial score. Below 60, the investors aren't making all of their money back Two, they're making none of their money back. And anything above 60 is sort of, you know, getting your money back plus a portion of your premium. You know, in the 80s and 90s, you may be participating beyond your premium. So I've, I've had fun rambling on and answering your questions. I've really enjoyed seeing everybody today. Thank you everybody who participated again, this will be live cast on YouTube. Please join us there. If you have any questions uh, beyond today that you didn't ask today, or if you're seeing this on YouTube, please sign on to Slated. If you don't have an account, what are you waiting for? And chat with our free support. Uh, these are people who work on the film finance team and work at the company and are um, really uh, highly qualified people to answer your questions and, they, and it's free. I, I don't even know why I keep saying that, but it is. So please, Come aboard to Slated, ask us questions, list your film. We'll answer any questions you have. I've really had an awesome time chatting with everybody today. Again, thank you for your questions. I think with that, we'll wrap up. So thanks so much for joining me and we'll see you on the site.